Anyway, it's a great honor to be able to present our speaker uh, today. I had a look at the summary of uh, your biography. Usually it's called the mini, bi mini bio because it's uh, a short description of your life. Your life has been very long. Your, the, what you have achieved is, is uh, uh, difficult to condense in a few words. You're employed by the uh, University of Birmingham. No, no. No, that, that is a... That's where I did my PhD. That's yeah. what you are, so your PhD is from the University of Birmingham and you've been living continuously in Eastern Africa for, uh, since uh, 1988. 88, yes, that's what I remember, 88. And um, uh, so uh, normally at home in Kenya, um, Jim Harris is here to share his uh, uh, academic experience and also his, uh, his own lived uh, experience. So this is a, um, a very, um, it's a first-hand account, if you like. Um, I do not want to take too much of your time away, and I would like to pass the word to our speaker now. Um, uh, for the uh, remaining, um, for the remainder of this uh, seminar, you are very welcome to, uh, to listen with your cameras on or off. If you have, once again, if you have questions that you would like us to discuss uh, afterwards, please send them to us uh, in a, um, please send them to us uh, as a message in the Zoom system and we will discuss them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lars, and welcome to those who've come to join us. Now, I'm, I'm not so used to hybrid systems, but if I kind of stand here and look out there, that's okay. Or you can stand wherever I like. Okay, and the folks online will still be able to see where I am. So welcome to those who are still coming. Uh, I gather more can still be added. I will try to project my voice sufficiently so that folks sitting, well, not exactly the back row, but you're heading that way, <laughs> will still be able to hear. I hope you don't think I'm shouting as we tend to do in Pentecostal churches in Africa, so, um, but not always. So um, um, thank you to Romina and to Lars for introducing me. My name is Jim Harris. Um, so my PhD comes from the University of Birmingham. I'm actually, actually adjunct faculty for the William Carey International University in California. And um, <clears throat> I'm the chairman of the Alliance for Vulnerable Mission. And I see a number of Alliance for Vulnerable Mission people up here on the screen. Um, the objective of the Alliance for Vulnerable Mission is to encourage Christian missionaries in the majority world to do their ministry using indigenous languages and indigenous resources. So that's kind of the, the core of the activities we engage in. We have a small research team um, that follows up on those principles and their implications and their importance in different parts of the world. So the topic I want to look at today is researching Africa in light of the religions of anti-racism and Christianity. Um, <clears throat> so considering anti-racism to be a kind of alternative religion to Christianity. Um, to some extent I got this from Tom Holland. Um, but anyway, I don't know how many scholars to mention to prove I'm a real academic or what. Um, the thesis um, that I'm putting forward regarding anti-racism, which is supposed to be provocative so that it draws the crowds, is that it's actually anti-racism as practiced in the West today renders development in Africa from the grassroots up almost impossible. And it also occludes the work of the gospel of Jesus. So it includes the work of Christianity from view. And that, again, is in the long, long term, um, I suggest, to no one's benefit. Um, so I'm here, and we do this work. Um, and on my part, at least, my conscience kind of pushes me. Um, I hope you can prove me wrong. Um, some of the conclusions that I'm coming to regarding anti-racism are not very mainstream. So far, they seem to me to be correct. Um, <clears throat> now, what you're getting here is a Brit who's lived in Africa 35 years. So although I'm a native English speaker, I'm sure my time in East Africa influences what I say and how I say it. 
Right. Okay, so let me continue then with the subject matter of the presentation. I thought about reading the paper. The paper, I'm sure, is available, but I thought instead of doing so, let me talk on topics. And if someone wants to interrupt and ask a question, I'm very happy to take such a question and to answer it as you go along. So if one is against anti-racism because anti-racism is doing a lot of damage in Africa, does that make one a racist? Well, I suggest not, um, because anti-racism works on the basis of a particular norm. And that norm is a white Western secular norm. And there, I think, is the major problem with anti-racism as practiced today. So. Okay, um, in terms of my work in Africa, let me talk more about that just now. I, I sometimes tell people I have five different ministries. My main ministry is teaching to indigenous churches in Western Kenya using the Luo and Swahili languages. Secondly, probably not in any particular order, I also look after children. Um, orphan children have done so for a long time. Um, thirdly, um, people have already been asking me, am I an academic? Well, I do spend a lot of time reading and writing and promoting particularly vulnerable mission. Fourthly, I work a lot with the Coptic Orthodox Church, who officially in my umbrella in East Africa, and I am also in Tanzania, usually one or two months a year, primarily in theological education, pastoral training. One person I know originates in Suez, I believe now retired, is Paul Gifford. Paul Gifford, in one of his books, introduces himself by saying he spent 30 years in Africa attending Bible studies, churches, crusades, conventions, in order to learn the functioning of African Christianity, if you like. So I say, well, I can echo Paul's words. Having lived in East Africa, including Zambia, initially I was in Zambia for 35 years, and I do similarly attend Christian events and engage in the discussion that's going on regarding the gospel. A difference with Paul Gifford, I think, is that I do so using indigenous languages. Luo is the language of Barack Obama, if anyone's ever heard of him. And you've probably heard more about Swahili, a uh, regional language, particularly strong in Tanzania, and to some extent in Kenya, but also way beyond. So those are my languages of engagement. And as I've mentioned, in the Alliance of Vulnerable Mission, we consider it important to engage people in their own languages, rather than in a European language, if they're in other parts of the world. Um, so, the, I'm considering anti-racism to be a religion. Some people may be a bit startled by that, but on the other hand, many of us may be aware that the category of religion is much contested and, in many ways, really quite ambiguous. In a sense, I think secularism needs the category in order to define what it is not. But yet, prior to the rise of secularism, of course, religion was the practice of Christianity by people in monasteries and in convents, as against the secular who were the priests um, outside. And nowadays, um, the category of religion incorporates all kinds of things that though those days wouldn't have been considered religion, um, such as traditional practices of witchcraft and so on and so forth. So what if Christianity is one religion and um, anti-racism is another? <clears throat> Um, that's kind of the question I'm asking. Now, in the religion of anti-racism, I suggest that the gods are European um, people. <clears throat> this it comes at least in part from Ogun, Ogunaiko. You may be familiar with him. I think he's a Nigerian scholar. He might be at somewhere in the US anyway. Um, because Westerners are the people others aspire to imitate. Now, I don't know if that applies in London. It certainly applies in parts of black Africa known to me. And they're also the ones who have the money. Now, people might argue, well, these days, lots of other people have the money. But they have the money, and they're concerned to use their money in the interests of those who might otherwise be less, um, be thriving less well. So those people who have a particular interest in going to the poor, such as much of Africa is considered to be, are typically people from a um, West European or more broadly European background, including, including of course those in the USA and Australia and so forth. <clears throat> um, so this 
orientation of Western people drawing on Judaism originally, or the Old Testament, and then Christianity to concern for the poor, um, has one effect of drawing people around the world to imitate those who behave in that way. Nowadays, the behavior is carried forward by those who no longer overtly confess to be Christians. So, um, what I want to suggest is, in our day, you have to follow that secular model, or you'd at risk of being considered racist. I mean, it, some examples are very clear. Um, English is widely known as the language of education. I think if I was to come to England and say that it would be better to educate East Africans in Swahili, then people would, I would risk being considered racist because that's implying that they're not as good as us Western people who get educated in English. <clears throat> so you see, English is associated with this value of secularism and it is racist to imply that people are not up to that standard. Now straight away we see a problem because, and in practice now, in much of East Africa, it is essentially illegal to do formal education other than in English. And how debilitating is that for the people? Maybe is a question we ought to be asking ourselves. <clears throat> so anti-racism defends the secular worldview. Now, when I say anti-racism, I'm talking about Western anti-racism. Um, we in East Africa, we kind of get the effects of what you do. Um, I think actually many people in East Africa, at least the, the less educated, uh, are pretty oblivious of anti-racism that's going on. But despite that being the case, the impact of anti-racism is certainly there. And in many ways, it defines who African people are in the eyes of those who are powerful in the West and, of course, in bodies like United Nations and, and even World Council of Churches and so forth. <clears throat> now, what it claims to be able to do is to uni universalize European styles without the gospel. So in order to not be racist, you're not required to preach the gospel of Jesus. You assume, rather, that those people who are setting the standard, whose forefathers were profoundly influenced by the gospel of Jesus for hundreds of years, their way of life can be attained by others without having to pass through the gospel. That's the implicit assumption, I think. Now, of course, if you disagree, um, either shout out now, throw something, or dispute later. <clears throat> um, now, why does the majority of the world take on this um, formula? Well, I think it's quite obvious because they're paid to do so. Those familiar with not only East Africa, of course, um, also, if, I don't know Ethiopia, where exactly it falls, East Africa or what, but West Africa, Southern Africa, the Bible, the church has spread enormously and people take it very seriously indeed. Um, <clears throat> but yet, um, in formal terms, that isn't what's important. So you, you've probably realized you might be a native um, Kikuyu speaker, you might be a native Kiswahili speaker, you might speak Kenyan English, but if you do serious work that has to be valued internationally, you write as if you are Brit or an American. So the standard of communication that's acceptable internationally is that of the Western world, um, Western people, and I'm I think this must be pretty much universal. Now, maybe China does, does their internal communication otherwise, but in Kenya, for example, to my understanding, as in many African states, internal communication also is measured on the standard of Britain or America, particularly. Um, now, I want to look at this issue by considering research methodologies, um, because I think part, well, we're in a context of research, I was just down in the research lab just now, or whatever you call it, um, and part of the problem that we're facing is that people are not being aware of the research they're doing and how they're doing it. I want to suggest. So four areas to look at here is one is the area of generalization. And probably, uh, I presume, at SOAS as elsewhere, the people checking the work that a student does are very wary about generalization. Um, in terms of the West and Africa, I want to question that a little. Why is Britain so determined that we not generalize in our research about Africa? Now, it seems to me 
that there is a major political motive there. If Africa comes out as a unity and Britain is different, then its expertise on Africa has to be questioned because it obviously doesn't have that comprehension that it perhaps ought to have in order to engage with African people on their own terms. Um, second language, English. Um, and I will come back to this uh, again and again. Now what I wrote here, <laughs> English is a big con. And unfortunately, um, I think that often that is what happens. What should be happening? If I, as a Brit, want to report on um, a tribe, say, in Tanzania, say the Wa'irak, then I need to learn the Iraq language in order to function with them and in, I don't learn it in a classroom, of course, but in living with the people. And then, from that basis, I can engage the very difficult specialist task of seeing how I can articulate that people into the crowded semantic space of English. Now, similarly, if African people want to engage in serious research of, say, British people, well, they need to learn English in order to hear what we're saying and in order to engage participant observation with what we're doing and then communicate back to their own people in their own people's language. Now, that basic essential system these days rarely happens because the West wants to hear about Africa from Africans and not from um, what they would consider neo-colonial missionaries who go over there to exploit them, using the um, evocative terminology there. And similarly, Africa wants to learn what we have to share from the West, from our own professors and in our own language. So the educational systems in Africa are in English. This, this unfortunately brings an immune response. Now, or immune rejection. I mean, if I try and think of an example, we say African people believe in witchcraft and practice witchcraft. And for many folks in Europe, I think when they hear that, it doesn't fit into the British worldview. Where's the witchcraft being practiced? Now, if you talk about white witches, it's a different world to what we are looking at in Africa. So telling British people that African people do witchcraft isn't necessarily helpful because it's not connecting it very profoundly with the where British people are. Perhaps a more profound way of connecting it would be to say that envy is very prominent. Um, participant observation, um, yes, all in favour of participant observation. And in a sense, that's what runnable mission is. It's getting to function with the people on their level so as to acquire effective understanding. But that participant observation by an anthropologist, perhaps coming from a Western country, is that necessarily of help to the native person they've researched? I suggest not. And again, I, I see myself as going against the tide, and I think that contrary to the tide understanding I've garnered over three and a half decades of living in Africa, and realizing how impossible it is when an African person, particularly before the smartphone, nowadays they don't really have to ask because they see it all anyway, but before that, asking me, well, what's Britain like? And do you have roads like this in the UK? And it becomes impossible to explain. We have the principle widely considered legitimate, uh, I pres presume, and so as also, if someone wants to write about, say, the Anmar people of Ethiopia, then before that goes to publishing, that needs to be checked by an an Ethiopian person to make sure that is true to what the Ethiopians believe. But on the other hand, how can that Ethiopian check the process that the scholar we hope is engaging of trying to take the Am, Amma, Amma, isn't it? Amha, Amha um, way of life into a way that it fits into native English comprehensibility? So I would like to bring a question mark to that process and say, if you're writing in the Amharic language about Ethiopia, no, in, sorry, you're writing in English on the basis of your knowledge of Amharic and Ethiopia, then an Ethiopian scholar who knows English and checks your work is one of your research respondents and not now the judge and jury on what you've written. Getting this in part from um, the thesis of Marcus Groman, who's on our call here. Back to English again. English, filling the 
important roles in terms of the secular world, and those are governmental roles, large finance roles, and so forth in East Africa fossilizes indigenous languages. Yet at the same time, English doesn't become, doesn't come to belong to East Africans. So then what is that prominence of English in these East African states and beyond, of course, West Africa, Southern Africa, and other parts of the world actually doing to indigenous people when the language they depend on intimately um, fossilizes rather than grows? I think actually we're facing a very difficult situation, perhaps something akin to a looming crisis that requires very, very serious policy change, let's say, in favour of indigenous languages, but of course the economics is very much against that, as is the means of communication these days. I guess you have a smartphone. If you know English, everything is a lot easier. But where does that leave us in terms of the future of the people of the, major of the majority world who are living in the majority world? Of course, those who, who become highly educated or move to the West pick up the nuances together with the language, but other people in their parts of the world may not do so at all. Hist history writing I had a quote from Weber in the paper that indicates really that history writing is a guess. How can you know which factor caused a particular event to occur if there's an infinity of factors that have contributed to it? Weber says something like that that often seems to be ignored when pragmatically historians portray things in a particular way in, with particular interests and share that interpretation that they are required to do, say with young people in Europe and beyond, and that becomes the truth for them. And in these days when people fear interference with secularism, then that acts to occlude the way that God works amongst his people. Um, we actually have a, a historical method in the Bible. I have heard it referred to, you might say, the Deuteron Deuteronomical method, but I'm not sure it's got a label as such. But to say that, the Bible interprets history in a particular way. An enormously popular way. I don't mean to say it's crowd-sourced. In other words, it didn't appear in a day. This is something that's taken generations and generations of formation. And up to date, it helps enormous numbers of people. But in the UK, um, I consider the Bible really to be jailed. It's not something that is brought into the public arena, I guess through fear, that if it became prominent, what would the repercussions be? Well, some of them might be that the African people who do value the Bible and base their life very much on it and then their faith in Christ would get a voice that at the moment they do not have. And we also have issues with the Bible in terms of Western um, ways of life and it's intriguing as I've been in UK for five weeks and considering how to communicate the Bible to folks within the UK on the basis of my comprehension being that they really don't understand many of the foundations I build on when in communicating the scriptures in East Africa. For example, let's say the, the role of blood in healing. Now, if you say to a typical British person that you need blood in order to acquire healing, I think they look at you funny. Whereas in much of Africa, that's just presupposed normal and required. Now, we do have scholars who reveal, let's say, um, if I use that term, the religious foundations of um, history, such as Max Weber I've mentioned, Mangal Wadi, some of you are familiar with, and um, Tom Holland, just examples that I, I can cite at this point, who write history and explain history. Weber, of course, renowned for his Protestant ethic as being the foundation of contemporary modernization and so forth. Okay, so going on more specifically to opposition to racism. Now, I've, I guess, stated that the West is the norm, 
Um, and I think this is really quite clear in mainstream anti-racism and it can simply be observed when you say something like if you say uh, a Zimbabwean woman can't cook proper chips you're racist but if you say a British woman can't cook proper ugali which is the what we or shima probably in Zimbabwe you use shima then of course you're not racist at all you're just making an observation so there's an expectation that the majority world will all easily be able to function as secular westerners do but secular westerners are exempted from that requirement in reverse so um, when I saw you came from Africa I assumed you wouldn't know good English it's probably an offensive thing to say but in the East Africa familiar to me I'm always being told when I saw you came from Europe I assumed you didn't know Swahili that's just normal so anti-racism always undergirds secularism and not to do so to portray African people as non-Western is really illegal of course what happens in a sense is when you're in Africa I mean an anthropologist can write about them and write extraordinary things but once they step onto Western soil actually I think this is magic they have to be transformed and anyone suggesting that more than the slightest amount of deep culture follows them into Europe is at risk of being accused of racism now this kind of thinking that perhaps those more familiar with how Africa functions um, can see through many do not see through so policies are designed on the basis that this is correct so let's say Kenya East Africa East African countries are treated as satellites of the UK much as America they expect to behave like America and Australia ignoring the fact that they actually are not native speakers of English at all and maybe are coming from a totally different world using the white man as a model for everything I suggest is too narrow and this is why I'm proposing that a much more comprehensive model is that of the scriptures themselves now I, I say in a sense what's going on is we have a majority world people accepting that the white man is the the model for them to imitate in order not to be racist about themselves and the Western world is happy with that because it gets them a get out of jail free card regarding their responsibility to God so in the contemporary West the main thing you have to do is to be not racist if you can succeed in not being racist you can breathe a sigh of relief and get on with life what the Bible says beyond it get, promoting egalitarian um, is kind of irrelevant so it's uh, an illegitimate kind of um, escape from the requirement for people to engage with God in their lives um, serious research about Africa again I think one would have to be extremely careful not to be found to be racist now I'm just thinking of an example of someone who was looking at white farmers in Zambia uh, was it in Zab Zimbabwe and as a British person it was very easy to condemn those wh white farmers for being colonialists you know bigoted greedy and so forth now I'm not saying people aren't that way of course we all are but are they particularly more so than others when actually they're facing cultural cultural environments that someone in the UK is not familiar with so arguably if they had to face them for an extended period would they behave more similarly so of course then anti-racism says that God would enable to prosper if you behave like the white man and the process continues I mean if you whoever is coming from a more wealthy part of the world and going to Africa they're not going to be engaged people who are not familiar with English but as soon as they find someone who can communicate in a Western kind of English then they're very happy and that becomes their friend that becomes the beneficiary that becomes the connection the bridge communicating a message on an ongoing way that he who imitates the West will be successful and he who does, does not is a fool I do wonder as in many parts of Africa children are in school for say 10 12 15 years of their lives often 7 in the morning till late in the afternoon
spending all that time learning how to function as essentially Americans? Wouldn't they perhaps be more usefully employed learning how to understand themselves and how to function in their own communities so that they could transform their own communities? Now again, the problem perhaps we have here is that the secular world doesn't really have a means of transformation. It just assumes that you get rid of religion and secularism remains. Um, the gospel, on the other hand, is all about transformation. And here's the question perhaps of the secular world not trusting that it is considering it's better not to empower majority world people because if you empower them, they might make a mess. Better to keep them dependent on us, then we can look after them. How long is that going to continue? The moment it looks like for perpetuity. Just briefly, ecclesiology in Africa. I work a lot with indigenous churches. Now, I'm not won't assume you know too much about what that means in Western Kenya. We, some scholars say there's three categories of churches. We have the Pentecostal churches, we have the mission churches, the indigenous churches. So the mission churches are imitating the way Westerners behave. Um, the Pentecostal churches are drawing on the power of the Holy Spirit while imitating certain forms, while the indigenous churches are continue to draw on the power of their ancestors. Now, I mean, I'm sure that's not accurate, but there's, for example, in a typical, what we would call an East Africa Royal Church, the presence of an ancestral spirit tends to be welcomed, whereas in the Pentecostal church, it tends to be um, something that is to be um, exercised. Now, uh, at an issue going on in all this, I think, is that those people who imitate Western e ecclesiology are interested. In other words, they stand to benefit. Certainly mission churches, if we take Methodists, Baptists, Anglicans, uh, Catholics, of course, and Gifford talks about this, um, having researched it, that the Catholics in Africa receive a lot of funds from Europe and so forth. So are they following this kind of ecclesi ecclesiological practice because it's in the hearts or it's because it's, they're getting the money? And the West is provider, and in Africa we tend to give God the credit. So does that make the West to be God? Are we ready to fulfill that role on an ongoing basis? Perhaps we ought not to be. What hazards does this bring for the future? So I don't know how time is doing, but I'm... Okay, good. Then I'm on target. Um, recommendations. The West needs to learn African languages. For Western people to acquire insights about Africa requires a Westerner to be immersed in African context and to learn in an African language so as to communicate back to the West in a European language. Now, I think this is a kind of moral imperative. If we don't take this seriously, we're continuing to disable those African people who become on an, depend on English, they don't understand why their languages um, are kind of frozen. And it's also, in terms of epistemology, appropriate, as I've already mentioned, for the foreign to be brought into the domestic by someone from the domestic sphere. Those who learn in this way, um, I suggest, not overlap their role with that of donors, because as soon as you take an identity as a donor, either directly or indirectly, if you have a friend who's a donor and you give them advice and you're a donor indirectly, then of course people speak to please in order to keep the money flowing. So that's one of the, those are the two principles of vulnerable mission I've talked about, indigenous languages and um, not using outside resources. Um, I'm suggesting that anti-racism dominates Africa without to my knowledge, many Africans even being aware that their identity is really being determined by the much more powerful people who emerged from Africa in the last, what, 500 years, now live in the West. Of course, economically they're powerful. In influ influence terms, they're powerful. They have a, a vote in a Western economy. They're familiar, um, fluent English speakers often. And they have a particular agenda. They want to empower them, themselves. But it seems to me that that agenda of empowering blacks within the West can be heavily, very much contrary to the interests of African people in their homelands. It's anti-development, as I've already indicated. It's anti-Christ. Ironically, 
when we go to Africa, we talk about contextualizing, when in the West, contextualizing is almost illegal. You know, I'm, I'm going to talk to you like this, or I'm going to share the gospel with you like this because you're African, whereas I'm going to talk to someone else with the gospel be like that because they're not African. I mean, that's just plain racist. But then what is contextualization? Surely we need to, as missionaries, adapt the work we're doing into the context we're entering. But yet when you do that, it's like you're illegal. And new missionaries, um, from people who've only recently come from Europe or America, uh, particularly find that difficult because they've been habituated for years or even decades to never, never think that the color of skin is associated with a culture and therefore we treat person different according to the color of skin. Now I know this is colorblind racism and there's different shades of racism and anti-racism and so forth. Um, but I, I've seen missionaries struggle with that for years um, before they see through it and begin to be able to adapt to the African culture. But then when they go back to the West, how do they deal with that then? Um, I've not lived in the West since I went to Africa except for short periods, so I can't answer that question myself. Um, contemporary means of doing anti-racism by simply holding up white men as a model, I think, are too simple. We need those who are bucking the trend. So I'm not advocating we now march on government and um, insist that the policies be instantaneously changed, but I am advocating that there be some people, and I hope this would be in the heart of Christian believers, who devote their lives um, not to the charitable generosity of giving people money um, which closes their mouths, but to, in, a, in effect, being ready to lay down their lives on behalf of other people in today's globalized world by connecting with them as they are and not as they ought to be, were, were, were they to be Westerners. So, a revival in that sense of missionary practice, but that must, even if the indigenous people would like it otherwise, and that's certainly the experience of many in Eastern and other parts of Africa, you go to Africa as a Brit or an American, and you, the people would probably say, no, don't bother learning our language. We know English. Why should you bother? It's a waste of time. And the, the missionary thinks the same, but in due course, they realize they're misunderstanding the categories that people are using and that is not helpful in the long term. So I think I'll call this monologue to an end here. Thank you very much indeed. First questioner, I see you find religion to be a product of Western secularism. We need cultural translation, which requires attention to language. English as lingua franca is a big question. While we publish multilingually, People often prefer English to get widely read. Credibility is in English. What do you think? Yeah, thank you very much. Religion is a product of secularism. Yeah, I mean, I mentioned that. And you can look at religion in many ways, but that's certainly a helpful way because a category had to be found um, to enable there to be something that's not secularism. Or secularism becomes everything, in which case it's religion. So you have to sideline that off. <clears throat> Culture translation, language, and nuance. Um, I, I think maybe we ought to go beyond nuance. Um, I was talking with someone recently, and the issue, they were doing research in a part of Africa using English. So then my question was, well, what about the indigenous language? And the explanation was, well, these people, they do at times use the indigenous language, and at times they mix. But so what? Now, the issue to me was not even if a person uses the indigenous language or English, but which category is being referred to when they do that. So if, for example, you have um, the spirit, so you can say spirit in English, and you might be able to say, well, what do you say? Immediately in the Lua language, we have an issue. What are you going to say? If you say chun, which is actually the liver, you know, then if someone is saying spirit in English, are they thinking chun? If they're saying chun, are they thinking spirit? So it doesn't require someone to be using a language or not for the category to have jumped. But that implies that you can't actually understand what someone's saying in English without knowing the indigenous language. Well, that's, I think, too much hard work for a lot of anthropologists today. <laughs> so yes, this language thing is broad and wide. Um, that's another articulation of it. Multilingual publication. Recently, actually, an, an editor sent me a Swahili 
piece. And he said, Jim, can you check this out? And should we publish it? And his references list was all English. And of course, what he was writing was, was as if in England. Um, he wasn't engaging with the, what I know as being the Swahili context. Why should he? I mean, he would be misunderstood. No one would take him seriously. So I suspected he translated it into Swahili from English. And I said, what's the point of me checking this Swahili for publishing Swahili when he's brought it from English? We need that original Swahili um, content. Um, I've, I've been in Kenya for 30 years. A lot of that time I've been asking indigenous people, please write something in your own language. And I at one time said, I'll get it typed. In those days, more typing. Translate it into English, translate it into Swahili, and then we'll give you a nice copy, you know. My results was one, one success. And that person wrote about angels and amazing things happening in the... It wasn't connected. I mean, that, that's hard to say, but one success, it was someone who brought these visions and no, no one else dared write. Because I think the other thing is, if someone writes in the indigenous language and he's translated, so this is what he said, they could be in trouble. Even a preacher, if he's preaching to their own people, um, he'd rather preach in English than in their own language and have it translated into English because the language that counts is English. Now the link I want to make here with this, all this also is with anti-racism. And I'm saying that at root of this problem is anti-racism. And we've got to stop being anti-racist in the way we are today. Which the West might throw up their arms in horror because everything seems to run on this notion of um, equal secular functionality. But what does it do in Africa? If we are required to assume that the African villager, if you like, is equally, is as functional in secular terms as is a Brit, who, whose forefathers have gone through all that history and he's inherited that history from them, whereas this person hasn't at all. So the culprit I'm pointing at um, is anti-racism as practiced in the West today. Second questioner. The phenomena of speaking to a foreigner in English by default applies as much in small European countries as in Africa, so this is not a racially related phenomena. Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, I would say that there is nevertheless racial going on. In other words, cultural going on. From my understanding, I mean, I haven't traveled that much in Europe, but Europe went through the same history to different degrees. So if you're in Holland, and you come and they start speaking to you in English, English and Dutch kind of run in parallel, whereas English and say Kikuyu or Kikamba or whatever the other African languages are so vastly different. But it's, it's yeah, it's interesting what you point out, that on a, a certain level, um, the experience is the same. But I think similarly though, there's a way in which English as a second language can be of value to Europeans beyond what it can be in Africa, way beyond. That would be my subjective, well, I don't know, my view on that, that if, if say, the European Union, not that they will, but if they said, we're going to use English for everything, it would do a lot of damage, but it would do much less damage than is being happening in Africa, because the cultural gap between the way English works and the way people think is so much wider. Third questioner. Does not the use of many languages in a university threaten the university's very foundations, right. i.e. its claim to have universal knowledge? Yeah, it's... The, the Euro Europeans somehow latched on to something that is connects to what we call the material or physical world with some profundity, so that connection enables the construction of machines and the devising of processes that operate way beyond what was ever there more than 500 years ago. Um, now, again, those things arose in a very Christian context. I mean, the great Enlightenment figures and so forth were almost all, in Europe, Christians. And these days you say, oh, so what if they were Christians and I'm not? But yet, they're also deeply immersed in the Bible and I think there's a case to be made that in order to enable majority world people to benefit from those things, a very deep and profound faith in Christ is, let's say, required. Um, now, many 
mission efforts invest in schools and hospitals and so forth and they're under pressure to do so don't just preach the gospel in many ways my, the, I these days think the best thing West could have done was to send people to preach the gospel in Africa and kind of hold everything else back you know don't teach them English don't even bring medicine don't but just share the gospel of Jesus and the gospel of Jesus to bring people release from the bonds of witchcraft and enable them then to develop an understanding that would be give them a, a level at which they could more happily engage with Europe than the kind of fossilized level of their own understanding is arguably at today. When I say their own understanding, the indigenous understanding. Now, of course, there's a lot of Western understanding in Africa, but it tends to be very dependent on umbilical cords of the West. You know, if, if you, I think if you look at East African countries, for example, whose governments function in English, they very clearly do so because that's what they're trying to get something from outside. If left to their own devices, well, they might use English, which will become a very indigenized English and soon be um, so radically different from Western English um, as to require translation. And of course, that's embarrassing if you have to translate English to English. Yeah, I've probably lost the track a little bit there, but I hope that's helpful. <laughs> Question of four. I observe that science privileges English and German almost everywhere, so giving other languages a major disadvantage. Would it be advantageous for African people to totally take over mission agencies of Catholic orders? Surely then they could do their own thing. Yeah, I mean, it, if I try and address that, um, well, I've talked about some missionaries not buying their way into African scene. Like if you go to a community and I'm, I've got $5,000, I want to invest it somewhere. <laughs> That's quite an impact, you know. Get a lot of people interested in you for that money and then it compromises on truth and everything else. Now English is a bit like that. My tongue is made of gold in that sense. I have native speaker English. So if I start spouting in English, um, it has its impact in drawing the kind of people who are interested in living in America. They want to be my best friends. Are those the people I want to be best friends with? Well, no, if I'm going to engage with the indigenous context, I need to be best friends with people who are serious about the indigenous context. Um, I can't use English. If I do, it will create jealousies, envy. Oh, sorry, you got another pen or should I throw you mine? <laughs> um, right, so for, for that reason, that's one reason I, I basically do not use English with Kenyan people or Tanzanian people. Um, the other thing, of course, that happens when I use English is that I've, I think as a Brit more than I do when I use Swahili and other factors. So, to me, when African people get a stronger hold on English, I'm very disappointed. Young men are then really get the message that English is the entry point. Then you start thinking. Before you know English, there's no point in thinking because no one's going to take you seriously anyway. So if I find a young man and he, he's, he's a thoughtful young man, I would rather him think where he is rather than give him the implicit messages, well, you might be thoughtful, but until you know English at this standard, what you're thinking is a waste of time. I've kind of given him a 10-year assignment, um, which, is, which is, of course, you can't communicate indigenous issues in English anyway. I mean, just downstairs you're talking about where's your home? I said to a British fellow, he said, well, our home is it's just down the road. No, your home where you'll be buried. <laughs> because in Kenya, your home is where you're buried, but you don't have a language like that in English. So how do you translate that into English? You, you kind of can't. The way forward to me has to be African languages. And what we can do is Westerners, if you're in a context where the um, for example, I taught theological, theology for 15 years in English and it became more and more difficult and asked, eventually they asked me to leave because talking to these students in English when they knew Swahili so profoundly and I had to teach this in incoherent way made less and less sense. So how about the missionary who just drops the powerful and stays where the people are by using their language and God knows what will do that with that in the future. It's not kind of solving the problem, but it's just beginning to give an alternative way of operating.
Fifth questioner. Does Mguji Wathiango give us a good model for the kinds of language issues you are talking about? Thank you, yeah. Um, I mean, Gugu Wathiango is a Kenyan, and indeed he writes, I think, nowadays in Gikuyu only. And a lot of what he says, uh, I think we would go along with in the Alliance of Runnable Mission. Um, and I think similarly, we really need Western missionaries or other missionaries, but let me not address Koreans who I don't understand, for example, who make a conscious decision, I'm going to use indigenous language. And th this, this is a very self-limiting decision because there's so much good you could do, in inverted commas, when you engage in English. You can talk to donors, convince them to build a hospital, whatever, whatever. But if everybody's on that activity, again, we have racism. Every white-faced person is powerful, influential, bringing in foreign donors. Every black-faced person is a receiver of money. The racism there is gross. So even if you don't have to become a beggar as a white-faced person, maybe I've used the wrong term there. Um, that's a loaded term. But anyway, um, it's a, I think it's known that the patron-client system um, clients need to benefit from patrons, Westerners come in as patrons, and that relationship arises. Can there be those who refuse that role in order to connect with the people more profoundly and take a step, if you like, against racism? Which is racism, anti-racism the other way around to in the West. In the West we talk about Africans coming onto white territory, it's very rare indeed for whites to want to come on African territory. Why is it so rare? It shouldn't be so rare. But the reasons it's rare are important. We should be understanding them. Question 6. Can you tell us, why do we these days have Western missionaries at all? What should be their purpose? Are you doing something broader than mission as we know it? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure I exactly understand exactly what you said. But um, let me say a few things. Um, one role of a Western missionary, as I've already indicated, is to communicate about Africa back to the West. Now, in theory, an anthropologist does that. In practice, anthropologists usually can't afford more than a year, or maybe a maximum of two years in a community, which is far, from, far short of the time needed to get a profound comprehension of language and culture. And this has been known for a long time. I mean, anthropologists classically go to this obscure community and they spend the night at the mission station, you know. <laughs> Question 7. But anthropologists are no longer as they were. These days, anthropologists are very reflexive and very aware of their own positionality. Right. I mean, if I talk about my own positionality in Kenya, where I've been for 30 years, and maybe it took 15 or 20 years to begin to be able to go to a church gathering and people ignore me. Yeah. It takes a long time. But once you get to that place, and you can hear what's happening, that also takes a long time, yeah. and you're not the centre of attention, then you're getting some kind of genuine insights, and it's important to communicate those insights to the right people in the West, in the right way. So I think that, that communication is vitally important. Um, and secularists basically are not going to do it. I mean, uh, I think, you know, if you want someone from a graduate, they're going to say, well, I'm, I'm looking for a salary of £60,000 a year or something, you know. And, well, who's going to pay 60000 a year for 20 years for them to disappear into the African bush? But missionaries are these crazy people who do things like that. <laughs> they need to be, people need to pay attention to what they're saying, but they also need to communicate in appropriate ways. And the thing that, the part of the problem today is, missionary equals take money to help the people and that is wonderful in its own way I'm not saying it's in wrong but there ought to be those who who sidestep from that identity so as not thus limit their comprehension and limit their, their coming alongside the people as equals um, at least not as um, always with a big shout you know if you like so if there's something happening, you can slot in. People know you're not equal, you're different, but you don't come in like a big crash and everyone stops what they're doing and now is looking for money. Now, I think also more generally, to speak against Western mission is kind of to imply all blacks, you know, Africans, come to the West, come to the West. Well, some people don't want them to, they're coming anyway, but the reverse direction is illegal. No, that's crazy. Question eight. But then, 
What is the role of a missionary? Surely not primarily to report back. Orthodox churches are setting an example that should be noted, of taking the gospel to the people. I mean, yes, fundamentally, what does a missionary do? He communicates Christ, communicates God to people. Now, how you communicate the truth of God is diverse. You can stand up and spout, or you can sit down and say nothing. You're communicating, and if you're sitting, you're saying nothing, and you're still there even though you're saying nothing. I mean, one image of a missionary is if he's not going to speak, he's not going to come. So if he comes, you give him the, the podium and he speaks, then he gives you money. So outside is a given prime position to speak and so forth. It is possible to relate to indigenous African churches and not pull their theology in a Western or money direction, I believe. I mean, I relate to many churches and intentionally, I don't, many of them might visit once in six months and I just show up speaking personally. They're, I know when their meetings are, oh, I ask, where are you meeting? And show up on my bicycle and I'm with them and then I go. If they say, we have someone who's really sick, we need a big bill to be paid, I can pray for them, I'm not going to pay the bill. This is where, again, Westerners struggle. They want to save lives and help, and this is a moral dilemma in its own way. But why does my geographical proximity oblige me to help when the others who aren't there never came in the first place? Am I more guilty if I'm living in an African village of those who die in the African village than you are who's living in London? Well, in a sense, maybe, but really, no, you've chosen not to go to Africa, perhaps, where the poor are, where that is your selfish decision, if you like, you know. So, I don't have to, because I'm there, feel obliged always to be the saviour. Now, we have this white saviour thing, of course, um, and people speak against white saviourism, but I'm not sure they realise the ramifications of actually not being a white saviour, let the people die. Ninth questioner. The question of power is more complex than that. It is, but the, the Westerner who doesn't have money is not entirely empowered. I mean, if someone has malaria, yeah. um, for 50p or, or a pound, you can buy malaria medicine that I find is basically effective. I mean, I use it and so on. Now, if someone has malaria, they'll, the indigenous people, there's a spirit, they drive out the spirit, they're praying all night, they're sweating, they're jumping, they're dancing. Now, I'm, I'm not trying to be disparaging. I'm, I'm just emphasizing a little bit. Um, now, what do you do? You pray with them, you beat the drum with them, you dance with them, or do you kind of say, oh, this is, you know, just take the medicine. And you take the medicine, the person gets better. But you're, again, using your dualistic knowledge to purchase authority and power. So I don't know what the answer ought to be, but it seems to me, in another sense, I do know, you, you cannot start using your rationality in those indigenous African contexts, because if you do, you're setting yourself apart. So I may not, I, I mean, it's hard for me to pray as indigenous people pray, because their whole life is, you know, all their heart, it, I, it's hard to do that when I'm seeing a bacteria or whatever it is, but yet, um, I must. Well, uh, I want to give again the chance to other um, graceful listeners who are listening, you know, very, very quietly, to ask questions or make comments. Um, so please feel free to unmute yourself and uh, speak out. We're up. <laughs> I don't know if you can see as well. Um. It's, it's more an observation, maybe a follow-up question to you, Romina, um, because I think the questions you asked, I think, are very pertinent in this uh, setting, but also in the time we live in. And I understood you as, um, as basically asking, is there a possibility of mission to be practiced in a decolonial way? Yeah. Um, I don't know if this is the, the, the heart of your question. Um, uh, if I may give a brief answer to that, you may, be, may come back to it or, or, or correct me. Um, what, what I hear Jim saying is that he's going out of his way to try to decolonize mission 
um, as far as possible. Um, for him, in his um, embodied form of being a missionary in this uh, local business context. Um, and what would fascinate me, I haven't known Jim and followed his work for a number of years, is that um, this seems to be a, a way of doing mission in rich commerce that comes alongside um, people um, and joins them in what they are doing rather than bringing in something from outside that then dominates the local scene. Um, and I don't know where this um, way of putting it um, would ask, maybe provide an, another way of answering your question um, and whether that would be satisfactory. Thank you so much, Marcus. Yes, I mean, I'm not in mission studies, so uh, I do, I am quite ignorant with even the definitions, but I have written a bit about sort of decolonizing this universalist understanding that all churches up, uh, took uh, the same missionary approach in African countries as the Western colonial missionaries because we have the Ethiopian Orthodox Catholic Church doing missionary work. We have the Malankara Orthodox Church in India doing missionary work outside of the world of this tradition of historically Orthodox peoples. But they have a very different theology that informs that mission uh, approach. And it's not about imposition and proselytization. Uh, and it is about people choosing freely. If, you know, that work resonates with them and they would like to, um, you know, so, so I guess I'm coming from the point of sort of, um, yeah, moving away, I guess, from, from a single definition of potentially in that approach. And then, and also out of curiosity, what does mission stand for churches that have Western origins? A lot of Protestant churches are considered Western in Africa, including Ethiopia, where I work in. Um, and there is a, constantly this debate of, okay, being within Western, let's say, evangelical churches or Lutheran churches, how do you approach uh, missionary work today, given Western colonial missionary experience? Does that, make, does that make sense? So I think you answered very well, because I think what you're saying is there is a way, and, and churches are mission. So missionaries are always way, looking for new ways to relate to the people that are not new colonial, you know, do not replicate that power dynamic. That was seen historically. If I if I interpret well your answer, um, so very enlightening. Um, Jim, do you want to comment on that too? Yeah, I mean, uh, thanks, Marcus, for making that contribution. And um, yes, I I go along with that. There is a way, and it's basically I think if you don't if you use only indigenous language, and you you ensure that you're not becoming a funnel for outside resources. Um, in one form or another, many forms. You know, if a if a fellow missionary is is using a lot of money, it forces you to make a distance between yourself and them, because otherwise he will say, "Well, who should I help? Those people, or those people." And you know, those people say, I'll "Help those." Or even if you don't say it, they'll think you said it, so they'll think your influence is use of funds. So it requires a certain kind of isolation, if you like. Um, but from that position where you walk alongside without trying to dominate and I mean if someone asks me to share God's word on principle I don't refuse um, I don't do it in English I use it Swahili or Luo and I'll share what I believe God has put on my heart and I don't attack them obviously um, and sometimes when I seem to be saying something you know obviously there's so many different perspectives again that they can take it or leave it whether they say it's wonderful or not I'll be back in a few weeks um, and whether they do it or not, I carry on. I'm not kind of making stipulations and so forth. So, yes, I believe it is possible and important that some Westerners do this to counter the, the racism that's inherent in the current withdrawal 